We could at least get a brief great view by uh, getting really close to the owl. Yeah, if you want to walk up to the owl so people can see. Uh, uh, this is Aaron Benbedek. He's a nice PhD student with Steve Chung at Harvard. Uh, I met him uh, during an old leave at Harvard uh, and have had the privilege and pleasure of working with him on a bunch of different um, things related to data log. He's down for the week to work with me on some more uh, data log sort of associated stuff. Today, he's going to talk about um, some cool technologies, uh, like the way SMT and data log can talk to each other and some nice innovations there. So thanks for coming. Cool. And I look forward to the talk. Yeah, thanks you all for being here. Um, this can be like very interactive. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, well the title is from data log programs to SMT theories, and the claim I'm making. You might need to focus on the keynote window. Okay. That every data log program can be transformed into an efficient SMT theory, and what I mean by that is that it should be possible to write a data log program, basically like stick it into an SMT solver, and then start writing formulas that refer to the data log predicates, like SMT formulas, and be able to solve those formulas efficiently. And in this talk, I'll uh, go through an example of what I'm talking about, go into the theory of like why this works, at least in, in, in theory. And then go a little bit into the practice, like the prototype we built and some potential applications for this. And so this is like very new work. This is actually the first time this talk has ever been given or the first audience to, to have ever seen this. That's sort of neat, hopefully. So um, and for our example, we're going to look at something really simple, which is uh, graph reachability and uh, thinking about what a theory of graph reachability might look like. We'll start with some background. So, are, are people familiar with data log? Just a little bit. <laughs> okay. So, the way I think about data log is, it, is it's like a simple language for stating logical inferences. So, here we have everybody's like favorite data log program. Like any thing you read about data log will always have essentially this program. Um, and what it's doing is it's defining graph reachability. And it, it consists of two rules, which are supposed to be read right to left as logical implications. So the first rule says that if there's an edge between X and Y, there is a path from X to Y. And the second rule says if there's an edge from X to Y and a path from Y to Z, then there's a path from X to Z. So this is doing like a transitive closure operation. And when you're writing a data log, this is like all you need to state. So it's just like a declarative statement of what transitive closure is. And then the data log engine will sort of like miraculously and hopefully efficiently actually like compute this. And what it's doing, like the setting is you're gonna be getting a set of input facts. So this is like a database that describes the world as you know it. So maybe we have some graph that has three edges in it, these three edges that are listed here. We're gonna uh, run our data log program on it and we're gonna get out the kind of derived relations, which we've uh, written these rules for. So this is the transitive closure of uh, sort of the, the edges, the reachability within the graph. One way to think about this is a data log program is like a function that takes an input database and produces an output database. So the input database is like the world, the output database is these derived things that we've written rules uh, defining. And data log was originally used uh, for stuff like deductive databases. So essentially SQL doesn't have any way to do recursion. So they wanted to add recursion to it. And this is sort of what they came up with. Um, but more recently, it's been really popular for static analysis. Like it scales really well. So you can actually write static analysis that crunch really large um, code bases. It's also used for like networking, uh, defining access control policies, that sort of thing. So on the other hand, we have SMT solving. So in SMT solving, you're given some complicated formula like this. They can have all different sorts of like crazy constructs in it. So we have like array axes. We have integer comparisons, equalities, uh, typical building connectives like conjunction and disjunction. 
and we give this to an SMT solver and it will tell us whether this sort of formula is satisfiable. And if it's so, like what's the model for it? So how can we instantiate the variables in here to, to find a solution? And for users of SMT solvers, normally just sort of this monolithic experience, you just like put your formula in it and it produces a, an answer miraculously. But on the inside, they're actually modularized in like a really nice way. So typically they have a, a, a SAT solver in the core. So this is just doing billion satisfiability. And then they're just these different sort of modules for each theory. So you have like a theory of integers, which tells you how to reason about integers. Theory of arrays tells you how to reason about arrays. And then maybe like a theory of blah, blah, blah. Like essentially anything you want as a theory could potentially be a theory. You could just stick it in there. Uh, at least in principle. And so SMT solving, as I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, like, I feel like now if you choose a PL paper at random, like there's probably like a 25% chance it uses the SMT solver for something. They're just an incredibly useful tool uh, for stuff like program verification and synthesis. So um, Let's think a little bit more about like the type of theories we can put in SMT solvers. And so this theory of blah, 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 maybe you want something it's a little bit more useful, like a theory of graph reachability. So what would this look like? Well, essentially what ultimately you want to be able to do is to write SMT formulas that involve like questions of graph reachability. And to demonstrate this, we'll just think about like a really simple graph. So here's a graph with two nodes and uh, four like potential edges. These are the four edges that could be in the graph. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna label each of these edges with like a Boolean value. And if the Boolean value is true, then we're saying that edge is included in the graph. And if the Boolean value is false, we're leaving that edge out of the graph. So now we can go and start writing um, some actual like SMT formulas. So, here is just like a really simple SMT formula, which is a predicate saying there's a path from zero to zero under some um, edges. So it's kind of parameterized by these Boolean values. And why this is useful is because we can ask the SMT solver, like, is this satisfiable? And if so, what's the model? And it will give us a model back telling that if we uh, want to satisfy this formula, like one model that's sufficient is if uh, E0, that is, that edge is turned on. And we can ask more complicated questions like, well, what if we have the constraint that E0 has to be false, like it can't be included in the graph. It can give us another model where you go to node one and then back to node zero. And, uh, Going on further, we can add like another conjunct saying that it must not be the case that there's a path from one to zero in the graph. And this here would be unsatisfiable. So this is sort of like our goal of what we want to be able to achieve when we're talking about like graph reachability within SMT. And uh, I guess, the idea of this work is like, how do we go about making this a reality in a relatively low cost way for like people who use SMT solvers? I use the fact, this claim we made earlier, that every data log program can be transformed into an efficient SMT theory. And so what we're hoping is that for this theory of graph reachability, we should be able just to sort of like plug in this data log program. So SMT solvers are like huge chunks, like hundreds of thousands of lines of C++. But in principle, like we should be able to do something where we just like write a little bit of data log and get a new theory out of it. And not only that, but um, it should actually be like relatively efficient. Like it should run. It's, as we'll see, it's, it's, a, it's theoretically efficient. It's not always like in practice super efficient, but uh, that's the hope. I guess before I get into this, is, are there any questions? I guess like yeah. 
what are like how are these theories represented like programmatically are they just like a list of rules so now like in a typical smt solver they're just going to be like a c plus plus class but okay. it's like uh uh, that's just implementing some interface that describes how you interact with the SAT for. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, um, to get into the theory of why this all works, you sort of have to start with the basic uh, framework that SMT solvers are built on, or at least like modern SMT solvers. It's called DPLLT, uh, where T kind of stands for like a generic theory. And this framework describes how the SAS solver uh, actually interacts with like theory solvers. And so here's a formula that involves like Boolean really connectives and equality and um, uh, like integer comparisons. So what's going to happen? So we have uh, on the one hand we have our poor SAS solver, then we have a theory of integers, and there's going to be some sort of like communication between these different parts. And the first thing that's going to happen is the SAT solver is going to come up with, uh, it's essentially going to view each of these theory atoms, so like x is less than y, as a Boolean proposition and assign a Boolean value to it. It doesn't have to do this exhaustively, so it can do like a partial assignment, so just some of them. So it's going to come up with some partial assignment. Uh, here we see on the left. So a couple of atoms are assigned to true and another one's assigned to false. And it's going to send that partial assignment over to the theory solver. And then the theory solver is going to take a look at it and see, like, it does this make sense like from, from my perspective as a theory of integers? And in this case, it doesn't because um, that those uh, first three um, atoms, like, taken together, uh, break. Uh, like the transitivity of less than. And so what the theory solver is going to do is it's going to come up with a, a, a conflict justification, which is a subset of the assignments where something here, like one of these needs to change its assignment because otherwise it's not going to be satisfiable. So in the case here, because we're talking about transitivity, like if we made, um, it no longer the case that Z is less than X, then that would be a satisfiable formula. So the SAT solver takes the, uh, the conflict justification and then adds it essentially as like a new constraint, like it learns it as a constraint and then comes up with another partial assignment like here, sends it over, and then this uh, SAT solver can say, okay, like that's good with me, I guess. So from my perspective, that works. And it's important to note that not all SMT theories are sort of equal uh, in respect to how effectively they can communicate with a SAT solver. So we might want to ask questions like, um, how quickly can you identify if there's a conflict? So like, do you have to wait for everything to be assigned before you can find a conflict? Or can you more proactively find a conflict just on like a partial assignment? Also, like if you when you find a conflict, how precise are the justifications you give? Because you can always just like throw up your hands and say, "Well, like this is unsatisfiable, um, or at least under this uh, this assignment doesn't work." And then you could uh, basically give back the entire assignment, but then the SAS solver hasn't really gained very much information to cut out like future or, like prune its search space. So the ability of um, an SMT theory to sort of like do this stuff in a, a nice way, plays a big impact in its efficiency. And there's a class of SMT theories um, that have some really nice properties uh, in this respect. And this is the class of monotonic theories. So these theories consist of uh, Boolean predicates that are parameterized by Booleans. And they have this monotonicity property where basically if you have a predicate that's been a, has a bunch of assigned a, a bunch of Boolean values, and one of them is false. If that predicate holds under that false assignment, if you flip it to true, the predicate uh, needs to hold uh, that as well. So this is why it's monotonic because 
uh, as you like flip on bits almost like if the predicate stays true. The other thing you want to have, uh, at least in practice, is an efficient way to decide concrete instances of the problem. Uh, so a good example is graph reachability. So um, here we have a theory consisting of predicates parameterized class by booleans, like we have this predicate path zero one parameterized by the, like essentially the edges in the graph, which are Boolean values. Um, we have this monotonicity property, which intuitively sort of makes sense. So like if something, if zero and one, if there's a path from zero to one and there's some edge assignment and you add another edge, there will still be a path from zero to one. So it's monotonic. And also there are um, efficient ways to solve concrete instances because you just like, if I give you an actual graph where you know the edges, then you just run like the graph algorithm on it. So it turns out that um, monotonic theories are efficient. And I apologize in advance because the slide has like a lot of text on it, but kind of work slowly through it. So um, what we're going to do, so we're like a monotonic theory. The set solver gives us some partial assignment, and we're going to run the partial assignment on um, two different things. We're going to create the negative extension of phi. So this uh, takes anything that's unassigned in the assignment and uh, assigns it to false, and the positive extension, which does the analogous thing, except for true. And this is interesting because it um, allows us to detect conflicts early. So for instance, if we want to be able to derive something, but it's not derivable under the positive extension, we know that it won't be derivable under any extension to that partial um, assignment. Because if it were, uh, then that would violate the monotonicity property. And then the analogous thing for if uh, something is derivable under the uh, negative extension, then it will always be derivable under any other extension. So do SMT solvers um, have in them the knowledge that if it's monotonic, then it will change their search space? Or is this something that happens on the theory side? Happens on the theory side. Yeah. But if you get a partial assignment, um, how do how does the theory tell the back to the to the set core whether to stop exploring? Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, so like say you want to derive something and it's not derivable. Um, then actually let's go to other case first. First, so we can use this to like sort of proactively and provide provide precise conflict justifications. So if there's something that is undesirable that you derive under the negative extension, then you can return the positive assignments in phi as a conflict justification. Oh, okay. Yeah. And analogous, analogously for the, uh, the positive extension. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so yeah, this is the sort of the interesting. So this monotonic theory paper came out in 2015, so it's relatively recent. Awesome. Any more questions? Um, questions? Yeah. Um, so by efficient, this turns it into polynomial time, right? Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I'm not sure. Could, I feel like there probably are still kind of like worst case scenarios where you have to explore the entire search space. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does have this like binary search flavor to it. Though. Yeah, it definitely you 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 definitely like from the search space as well. Yeah. So the the cool thing that our our work is based off of is the observation that data log programs are monotonic theories. So we have this functional characterization of data log programs. We'll take an input database and produce an output database. And viewed as a function, this is monotonic. So like if we take some input database and we extend it with some, some new input facts, everything we derived initially 
will also be derived under the extended database. So the way we can go ahead and construct the monotonic theory from data log program is take all our possible output facts and construct an SMT predicate that corresponding to that fact, and then parameterize that predicate by these Boolean parameters where each one corresponds to possible input fact. So it's like, uh, should we include that input fact in the uh, input database or not? And because of the monotonicity of data log, we know that the resulting SMT predicates are monotonic. So this is like a monotonic theory. And furthermore, there's an efficient way to solve concrete instances of it because we can just run a data log interpreter. So it, um, it's efficient in the sense that it always yields a monotonic theory. But the encode, we have to construct an SMT predicate for every possible output fact mm. um, has a little bit of a. Yeah, so it's actually, there's, um, this is like the more theoretical exposition, but when we get into practice, we avoid having to like actually create a different um, uh, predicate for each one. Yeah. There is sort of this limitation where you have to, um, like your uh, potential input facts have to be finite because they like to be parameters. And so in, in certain cases, this might be a, a limitation. Yeah. Like, I guess you can always create a theory that's monotonic by uh... Hey, let me think about it. Okay. Mind, mind? Yeah. So, um... I'm not familiar, too familiar with how data log works, but are you able to like say to data log, uh, say give a path from one to zero, even though, okay. Oh boy, no, I keep going. I'm oh, sorry. So, so you have like, say you have like a path from one to zero, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, your examples before you were showing just your paths are, we have edges from here to here. So, um, no, typically there's a separation between the like derives and the input. You could always sort of like get around that by having a, an input relation, which is essentially like path, and then path is like a superset. I guess my follow up question then is how do you detect when, say, like in your previous example, you said there is not a path from one to zero is kind of your input. I guess uh, where does that put the, the SMT software then? So there is like we're going to be essentially doing what um, the monotonic theory is doing so we uh run the data log solver twice one oh. under the negative extension one under the, under the positive extension and oh. then based on that we like uh, uh return conflicts um i'm still a little bit confused sorry so so you have this query so so you assign say false to this path mm. variable mm -hmm. But are you able? But if are you not able to take that as an in, aren't you not able to take that as an input to the data log program? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, you're not. But um, so like we have our our SMT theory, which basically knows all these constraints. The data log solver doesn't know any of these constraints. You just tell us like which input facts are full, okay. and then it's the job of the monotonic theory to like take the output of the data log. Then gotcha. I can't see okay. how that matches up with the, the constraint set. Okay. okay. In SMT, you could assert that a path didn't hold and then try to assert that some other path did and try to find a model that way. And that would involve multiple trips back and forth to the data log for the different path queries. I see. Okay. So um, not only are data log programs monotonic theories, they're actually special monotonic theories. Um, and this is because we can provide especially precise conflict justifications <laughs> by using data log provenance. And so this is sort of borrowing heavily from this um, Popple 2020 paper on data log program synthesis. And how this works is um, say you're able to uh, derive some fact that's undesirable. You can look at the data log provenance, which is like the proof tree or whatever fact you've been able to derive. 
and from that figure out which inputs were used in that first trip and then return those inputs as being, or like a billion parameters corresponding to those inputs as your conflict plots. So this is efficient, or it's like more efficient than normal monotonic theory because you're guaranteed this will at least, it won't be any larger. It would actually be a subset of the positive parameters and the negative extension. So like it's more precise in that measure. And what's cool is like, if you look at graph reachability, what it's actually doing is like, you're pulling out the edges that are used along that path and saying like, one of, like at least one of these can be turned on. And then the case for if a desirable fact is not derivable is a lot more complicated. Uh, essentially you're trying to generate like why not problems, like why wasn't something derived. But you can use a technique based on about debugging to try to find like a small set of responsible uh, billion parameters. And this is more precise as well, because this is going to be a subset of the ones in uh, the positive extension of the virtual sign. Any more questions about this is like the theoretical side before we get into the how are we doing one time? We're, we're doing great. Okay, cool. Okay, so how does this look in practice? So uh, we've gone and we packed this into CVC4, which is like one of the major SMT solvers. And um, we sort of generalized it from what I showed earlier. So now we have this sort of like general theory of data law which handles all the stuff with like uh, creating the conflicts and managing different constraints. And then you can kind of hook it up to like whatever data log program you want it to. And as a user, if I wanted to add a new program, I just have to write a couple of classes of C++, which basically tell like, how do you translate between input facts and Boolean parameters, um, which is relatively low weight as far as like dealing with SMT solvers go. And we are able uh, to then write SMT formulas involving data log predicates that are in this form. So D log is our kind of, we have like our theory has a single data log predicate that has that name with uh, these arguments. So the number of parameters, the billion parameters, uh, the, the relation name, and then the actual like, tuple arguments. <coughs> and then the Boolean parameters themselves. So this is where we get away from like having to define an actual predicate for each possible output fact. And then we can start writing like SMT with formulas that look sort of like this. So this is, I think the same as our example from earlier. So we have the uh, Boolean parameters, which are the edges, and then we can write um, different predicates saying like which what's reachable under this graph. So uh, given that we now have this, like what is actually useful for, or like what do we hope it might be useful for someday? One application <laughs> is Get out of here. <laughs> uh, so one application is in prototyping SMT theories. So as I mentioned before, uh, SMT solvers are these like massive beasts. Like nobody really wants to go into Z3 and like add a new theory. Um, and like partly because it's a ton of C++, uh, partly because like you're gonna be responsible for figuring out how to provide precise conflicts, which isn't always obvious. And our uh, framework provides a mechanism to like more easily prototype at least like a subclass of, of potential SMT theories. So it's like easier to write data log than C++, uh, probably, but almost certainly. Um, and uh, using our tool, which does all this for you, then you get precise conflict justifications. So this sort of nullifies two of the major challenges with adding a new SMT theory. And in terms of what theories you can actually state, like essentially anything you can state as a pure data log program and that can be like meaningfully parameterized by a finite set of inputs is fair game. And uh, data log is p-time complete. 
So uh, you'd have the theory would have to be such so that concrete instances can be are like polynomial in time. So that leaves like a lot of I think a lot of potential. We're still like exploring that space and seeing like what practically is useful. Another potential application is reasoning about data log programs, because now that we can write SMT formulas that like refer to predicates uh, defined in data log, we can maybe start doing asking interesting questions about them. Like if you think about what we were doing with the reachability example, we are essentially running our data log program backwards. We were saying like, given these uh, reachability requirements, like what input facts can lead, to, lead this to happen? And so a neat use case of this might be is like if you have some safety property of your data log program, you can state its negation as an SMT formula and then try to find a model of it, which would be like a counterexample of that safety property. Another use case, which is uh, fun and like uh, Mike and I have been doing a lot of work in this area recently, sort of a different approach, but is actually trying to synthesize data log programs in particular, like if you have some uh, set of candidate rules, like trying to choose uh, um, the correct subset of those rules as your program. So in particular, um, we're going to be getting like an input output example and a set of candidate rules. And we want to choose a subset of the candidate rules so that if you run that subset on your input, you get the expected output. So here, we, our input might be some of the edges in the graph, and our output might be some constraints on uh, like, um, uh, what, it's sort of like, it's constraints on what we want path to be. So um, unlike the previous case, when we're trying to like find edges here, we're trying to learn rules and I'll show that in a second. So in particular, we're going to have some set of candidate rules. And here are five rules here. And uh, you can see that they each, like the final atom in the body of each rule is this rule uh, predicate. And here, our input database is going to consist just of this predicate. So it means that we can turn rules on and off by whether we like to turn rule two on, we include the fact rule two, and to turn it off, we, we exclude it. Did you do, um, so it's like kind of a template-based uh, synthesis approach. Mm -hmm. um, what other things can you support? Like more expressive templates? That mm -hmm. I'd like, so this, this is pretty closely mirrors like a, uh, another, I guess Popo 2020 paper I mentioned earlier. So we're just following that approach. In terms, like it, it all depends essentially like whether you could phrase the different possibilities as being like potential inputs. Like this works really well because we can just like turn rules on and off. Um, certainly there's a lot of room about how you go about generating like the candidate rules. Um, but in terms of like different synthesis algorithms, you'd have to think about how you can actually like phrase it in some sort of way that works with this. So the paper this is all based on is a paper called ProSynth. It's actually sort of like the most recent paper and a whole line of work that is sort of based in this particular setting of candidate rules. And the way ProSynth works is by Cetus loop. So they have a SAT solver, which suggests a choice of rules. They run a data log solver around that choice. And then if there's some sort of conflict, then they use the data log provenance to construct blocking constraints so that the uh, CGIS loop like avoids that solution in the future. And you know, notice this is like very similar to what's sort of happening inside the SMT solver. We just kind of like generalized what they're doing. And uh, in the numbers that follow, uh, it's like sort of a modified version that uses C like R C V C four instead of C three, just to kind of make things fair. 
In our approach, what we're going to do is add a new theory that's parameterized by candidate rules. And then we can write the alpha specification in SMT lib. So uh, here we're like asserting like things that have to hold on that path or that um, which path things should hold. You note know that the rules here or the predicates are parameterized by like the, the real variables. And so if we uh, run this, uh, we could get a model that says that rule one and rule two are like the rules that should be selected. We ran this on a set of benchmarks from the Fresno paper. So Fresno paper has like three sets of benchmarks. We ran it on one of them. And these are problems um, from kind of AI knowledge um, community. So Fresnet does uh, okay on uh, a bunch of these. And they sort of vary, typically like the larger the candidate rule set, the slower Fresnet is. Our numbers are um, a lot faster in general, not like astronomically faster, but pretty good speed up. And actually, I'm not totally sure why this is the case. I have a couple like different hypotheses. So one hypothesis I have is that Frosnet doesn't take advantage of the monotonicity of data log at all. And so it's always working on a full assignment. So I guess from a set solver, it gets back a full assignment, which means that the complex it gets are gonna be sort of like late in the game and typically larger. Um, so I ran our tool in a setting where basically we only um, check for conflicts under a full assignment. And it made uh, some difference, but not a huge amount of difference. Um, so I'm still sort of investigating like, what could be going on there. Interesting that in one case, the same gen benchmark, I think, yeah, that uh, it's actually faster if you wait to do, uh, to check full assignments instead of. Why is that? Are there just tons and tons of ID um, variables? Or there's like the there's rules? this really big tension between how often you want to check for conflicts, which involves going to the data log solver, so that's expensive, versus uh, how useful is it to actually report a conflict. So I have our tools are set by default to only check for conflicts every um, after like five billion parameters have been assigned. This is actually slower if you check up after every single one. So you'd get conflicts earlier, but that's overshadowed that, by the overhead of- Is going. that five just arbitrary? Yeah, just like seems to work well. Like I think there's there's like a definitely interesting space of heuristics in terms of probably like you can make that number dynamic or use different- Yeah, not criticizing. Yeah, yeah, just curious. Yeah, no. Like, Definitely in some of them, it does work better to make it bigger in some of them, probably better to make it small. But... So um, that sort of brings me like very close to the end of the talk. So I've talked about this idea of like data log programs uh, being turned into SMT theories. I've made this claim that every data log program can be transformed to an efficient SMT theory. And here, the really like the key connection is monotonicity. So this connects data log and monotonic theories, and this is like what a, that makes things work. And then, sort of a nice thing is that on top of this, we can use data log problems to get more precise conflict justifications. We prototype this. And then you sort of explored a couple of different applications. So prototyping novel SMT theories by writing them in data log and uh, reasoning about data log programs by writing SMT formulas about them. Yeah. Thank you. We definitely have time for questions and discussion. I don't know if there's anyone on Zoom, on my computer. I have a question. Have you tried to implement a subset of like one of those actually like complicated theories in data log? Like, um, like what sort of like? I, like I was thinking like maybe integers with less than. Oh, or something um, like that. 
I'm not sure how easily that could be encoded in data log. Like I have done stuff where you do have a complex, um, basically I had this like sort of world generation scenario where you have a bunch of like potential planets in the galaxy and there are rules for like when plants are in contact with each other. Like if they're in contact with each other, are they, do they trade with each other? Or are they at war with each other? And so on and so on. So like a bunch of different rules. And so I've, I've, I've done experiments using that oh. sort of program. Okay, that's a lot. Uh, allow mutual recursion. Allow. Um, mutual recursion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that works really nicely. And is it required that the program terminates? Yep. Yeah, so pure data log. Um, I probably should have said this, but there are no like constructors or anything. You just have constants, and so you're you're guaranteed that things will terminate. Dave has a question on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Really interesting talk. A lot to think about. Um, one superficial question is why CVC four versus C three? Z three was there something particular you needed? Um, well, CVC four had some instructions about how to add a new theory, whereas uh, Z three didn't. So, the uh, like, different. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, CVC four even has some scripts that, like, mostly worked um, for creating new theory. So, I'm a little yeah. shocked because, like, ten years ago, a PhD student of mine added a theory to uh, Z three. At the time, people were adding it. Yeah, at that time, they were just implementing that API. And people were also using it to do um, separation logic solving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that point, it wasn't so well documented. And we had great fun because every time uh, people at Microsoft <laughs> submitted a bug report, uh, you know, Leonardo would say, oh, we just got that one from Stan Rosenberg, too. Um, but by now, I would have thought they would have documented it. So I guess I'm wrong. Um, more about the actual work, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this encoding. So yes, you have a single predicate. Um, but this thing has multiple arguments, right? So are we, you know, in some sense, we're talking exponentially or more uh, different predicates or something, right? And uh, so one well, in, uh, conclusion of that seems to be you're limited, the number of vertices, if you will, in the graph type example has to be fixed in advance, right? So- um, the Potential edges, right? Yeah, so this is where, uh, let me go back a couple slides. Yeah, there it was. Or, um, like this, this slide. Right. Um, so as part of the glue code that the user writes, they basically write a function that says, what's a reasonable number of parameters to have? So for um, graph reachability, N always has to be a square number because, um, or sorry, it has to be, yeah, it has to be a square number because there's the uh, number of edges are always going to be quadratic in the number of vertices. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then the both the relation name and all the tuple arguments have to be uh, constant, like literals. And so those aren't, um, in some ways, those aren't even like a true like argument to the predicate. They're just sort of like fixed. So, so in the path, you couldn't, you, you couldn't be use a symbolic node to talk about who you might be having connections with if you yeah. know the names of the person. Exactly. Right. So this is gets, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you know, my broader question is, Oh, it, this seem, could be a very cool alternate to the existing ways of dealing with recursively defined predicates in SMT. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what are the risks? So one thing is that the data log rules then will only have other uh, predicates within the system of data log predicates, right? You can't have integer or array formulas. Is that true? So um... A lot of uh, variants of data log do support basic integer arithmetic and stuff. So if you needed something basic, you could do it. If you want to actually have uh, within the solver, though, then it, that's not going to be interacting through DPLL. It'll be uh, within the data true. log solver. Is that right? Yeah. Although, um, so Michael and I have another project called Formulog, which is basically uh, data log plus the ability to call into an SMT solver. Mm -hmm. And so formula is also monotonic, so you could 
sort of do the same thing with formula. So you could have an SMT solver that calls into data log, and then that data log sort of like calls back into the SMT solver. But that idea hasn't been fully fleshed out at this point. All right, I see. So something like uh, reasoning about programs working on a heap with some heap representation, you're not going to be able to encode that because you could encode some approximation where there's some fixed number of potential objects and references, mm. but, but you have to fix that. Mm. So, so the fact that you can't parameterize based on variables means you couldn't express some fact like saying there does not exist a path from zero to any other node. Yeah, without uh, writing out all the other. Yeah, you have to like you have to write them out. Yeah. Oh. But we also know that there are finite amounts, so that should be doable. Yeah, this is this is definitely based on like a very finite setting, or like it's, it's all the assumptions are. Um, we have some ideas about how to maybe extend it where you can. It'd be like more flexible, and you wouldn't have these same limitations, or at least there'd be more flexible ways around them. So, Dave, I'd also suggest that. Just as um, for a given program, you generate specific verification conditions to send to an SMT. For a given program, you could generate specific a specific data log program to reason about that program's heap. So, if you were doing right, so if you were implementing like a, using SMT, but you're implementing some kind of program analysis where you've got abstract locations associated with allocation sites or something like that, I could see that you could encode that. But the sort of encodings people do that are uh, precise semantic representations of the heap using maps and so forth. You're not going to be able to get reachability. You're not going to be able to find arbitrarily large instant, you know, heaps that satisfy some constraint because you, you won't be able to express. There has to be some upfront, be some upfront abstraction of the program, and then from that, boil it down into the finite uh, mm -hmm. data log encoding. Uh, although then, if you find out it wasn't a sufficient one. We have to revisit the upfront abstraction. Yeah. yeah, it's not clear how to close that cigar loop. Like, it, I don't know what feedback you get to say. Either this is truly not going to work, or maybe you need a bigger, a better model. Mm. Well, yeah, I wondered if you like had this like a front end of the whole thing that we provide a K mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, it explodes it up to whatever the K you give it. And then, mm. use that. Yeah, yeah, you could do that sort of thing, but the, the cigar type loop might be difficult to make sense of. So do you have some program analyses that, uh, on the positive side, do you have some interesting program analysis that does fit the framework? Um, I feel like, like from what we've done so far, I don't, I wouldn't say so. Like, I think, um, like, I guess mostly we've been thinking about it as a way to sort of like run data log programs backwards, which seems a little weird in a program analysis setting. So like say you had like a pointer analysis, like you could potentially run the pointer analysis backwards and get back to, uh, like, like given some constraints, like a points to, points to set, you could run it backwards and then uh, get like a Java program that would satisfy those points to constraints under that points to analysis. But then it sort of uh, gets into this question of like, how do you choose what your like finite input set is when you're talking about the space of Java programs? So I, I think like uh, the way I see it fitting into static analysis more is like maybe there are uh certain like predicates like if you have an smt based static analysis and then maybe there are certain predicates that are a lot easier to define in data log like uh if you have like some sort of like subtyping rules or something like that and then you could refer to those predicates from whatever your um uh smt constraints are that your analysis is generating so i see it at least like in this current form being more useful in that respect than probably it being an entire static analysis uh, in itself. Well, 
Yeah, to, to follow up on that, Dave, what I'm excited about here is this idea that uh, data log in some sense characterizes inference rules. And so this is a nice way to start thinking about inference rules, this sort of like very least fixed pointy form of reasoning uh, in SMT, which is this very sort of like flat classical reasoning. Um, so to me, that seems like a nice way we can try to start to bridge the SMT style world and the sort of like inductive like type theoretic style world. But I think oh, right, that's yeah. very attractive in that way. But then it's that the limitations of the encoding, I'm trying to understand what the implications are. So how how much, yeah. you know, which things defined inductively could really be represented this way? Yeah, I think, I think getting a clear story on constructors is maybe the biggest step towards mm -hmm. working that out, right? Because like you have this notion of um, algebraic data types in SMT. Right. Right. And I think try, bridging that gap to me is, I think, sort of the, the biggest challenge. I don't know if, you, if you've thought about it. I haven't thought about it. But uh, so beyond data log to prologue, essentially, right? Well, no, well, it's slow, slow down. But yeah, <laughs> close. Uh, I, I think keep data log semantics, but add constructors, which like, OK, that makes you general purpose. So in a sense, oh, like so prologue. stratified prologue or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I phrase it as data log plus constructors in my head, but maybe that's just anti-prologue prejudice. Uh, you wouldn't have any of the like the non-logical yeah exactly uh, aspects of prolog so yeah. like cut or assert yeah that's splitting hairs though but yeah I think I think you're right sure right I mean there's there's a spectrum of people working in logic programming to from the super pragmatic prologish stuff to you know stratified prolog programs etc cetera, etc cetera. so but the, the point is, yeah so I see your point so data log plus just constructor so you have data you have uh, inductively defined data, but that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that sweet spot is already, I think, hit by formula. It's just sort of, I guess this work takes a totally different perspective on who's in the driver's seat. Like, so here, like SAT SMT is driving and then data log like sort of gets to give you some directions. But in formula, it goes the other way. We're like, okay. And like, ideally we can find some middle ground where like, Either one could be driving, but I think neither neither system has that quite yet. Yeah. But you've already got lots of interesting accomplishments. Definitely in exploring a promising space. Thanks yeah, for sharing this work more. with us. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Cool. Uh, let's thank Aaron one more time.